Cool. So you can hear me with this mic. Awesome. Uh, that was a tiny little chunk of a totally unrehearsed performance. So now I'll just like put my other half of my brain on um, and talk about some technical stuff. Um, so just a, a little bit more about me so you guys have some context maybe. Um, I think I've been a hacker for most of my life because um, I got a, a bunch of stereo equipment from an older brother and he taught me how to solder when I was like eight or nine and that was the beginning of me like plugging guitars into other things and and connecting electrical things in ways that they weren't intended to. Um, <laughs> and I was kind of a more traditional musician uh, playing things like guitars and drum sets and singing uh, for most of my life. And then I got really interested in electronic music um, when I stopped playing video games and started programming and figuring out all the interesting ways you can kind of mash those things together. Um, um, so, uh, and at some point I, I quit playing in bands. I got really frustrated working with humans. I decided I was a lot, <laughs> a lot better like building machines um, to do my bidding and you know, they would always show up for rehearsals and just say, like, play. Stop. Uh, and <laughs> Um, and that was easier, and I still, I still hang out with humans, and uh, we get along just fine. Uh, but, but making music with machines uh, has become a big passion of mine, and um, I, I think having that, that traditional musical background is part of why I got interested in hacking, and then ultimately uh, building uh, controllers. A controller is just a generic word I use for anything you plug into uh, a computer. Um, you know, it could be a video game controller could be a more musically inclined controller. Um, it's cool that that whole world is kind of meshed together and you can use things like your, your Wiimote or whatever to uh, manipulate music. And um, so that's the world I've been exploring for the last uh, eight or nine years. And um, yeah, and so that's what I'm here to talk about uh, today is, is more or less uh, instrument design and how you can make your own instruments. So I'm not much of a uh, presenter but uh, I've got a little slideshow to show you guys some pictures of these instruments. So we'll see how this goes. Um, first one I'm going to talk about is uh, this instrument. This is called the Mojo. Um, and this began originally as a keyboard that I hacked up um, because at the time I was uh, I was getting into all this. You couldn't uh, buy the cool controllers that are out there. That's my name. That's my my symbol. Um, you can you can buy anything even close to this. Now there's some pretty phenomenal controllers on the on the market, and you can buy things with blinky lights and buttons that are totally integrated with your favorite music software package because uh, um, mass manufacturing and uh, and all that has has uh, always been a part of, of musical instrument manufacturing, but now it's caught up to people who want to make music with controllers. So cool things are available. Um, but I was just hacking up keyboards, and um, and this is the thing that I I came to, um, and it's uh, just basically maybe like three things you can't really buy in a store. One is it's shaped like your hands. It's you can see it's very much patterned after a mixer, right? It's got five faders and it's got a bunch of knobs and switches and things you'll see on uh, on mixers like they'll have back there or you know DJs using clubs. Um, but it's just kind of based around the shape of your hand, which seems uh, really intelligent to me. Um, um, but that's the thing: is mixers were not originally envisioned as performance instruments for playing live music. They were envisioned for like, you know, um, radio DJs to use to bring in this thing or that thing, or mixing engineers to mix live bands and you know do meticulous, more microscopic adjustments. So for gross, uh, quick and uh, big gestures uh, like are necessary for performing solo music, uh, it's cool to have it shaped like your hands. Um, it's built really well. I've dropped it at least once. You can see all the dings and scratches on it. Um, but being made out of metal and wood, having easily replaceable parts uh, is cool if you're, uh, if you're a traveling musician and uh, you don't have to desolder knobs from circuit boards and find esoteric parts out of catalogs to try and fit them back into the circuit board. Um, there's just one circuit board in here, um, which is a, a kit I got. Oh. And speaking of kits, this is one thing that's not in the slideshow. So. 
I'll just talk about it while I'm thinking about it. Um, I'm teaching a workshop tomorrow, additionally, at 4 p.m., uh, where I'll show you how to solder uh, these little circuit board light theremin CDs that I have. It's a, it's a light responsive synthesizer built into a CD case. So uh, if you want to learn how to solder or get better at soldering or if you just want a really fancy CD artwork thing, um, come, come to the hardware hacking area uh, 4 o'clock tomorrow. Um, okay, so the Mojo. Anyways, uh, what's cool about this is I'm not, I'm not a carpenter. I'm not a metal worker. I'm none of that. Um, so this is all made possible by just the availability of vector drawing programs uh, where I can just buy some parts out of electronic catalogs and video game parts catalogs and um, measure them up or use data sheets and plop them into drawings and get enclosures and brackets uh, from shops that do this kind of stuff with CNC machines or friends who have access to uh, hacker spaces that have these tools or, um, or other resources. It's basically the availability of rapid prototyping tools like laser cutters and CNC routers and water jet cutters and stuff uh, that make it possible for me to just kind of do one aspect, which is the design and the drawings and not have to do too much of the fabrication. I still do a lot of soldering. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, that is the mojo. So this kind of operates as my band, as it were, and allows me to just kind of conduct and do these uh, kind of gross gestures. Um, so I'll have things like drums, <coughs> uh, which I can manipulate in simple ways, more complex ways. and just do all that with my right hand basically really fast and intuitively. Um, that being the other feature of this thing is it's laid out to be um, really non-repetitive and give you good tactile feedback. A feature of musical instruments, which I don't see in a lot of the mass marketed ones um, out there is, uh, is this, this, this sense of like teaching your muscles to do things and you know putting activities like uh, playing things really fast in complex patterns. I mean I'm not the fastest person I know, but um, can you hear that? What is that? Hang on. Just being able to tap out rhythms on a button and move this finger in another way, like these are just things I've done many times and eventually you develop uh, speed and accuracy. Um, things you all get if you drive a car or ride a bicycle every day, you know. Um, that's very much what playing musical instruments is like to me. Um, so anyways, having something that's not a big grid of buttons or a big grid of faders and knobs, um, it makes it much more possible to learn the thing um, through tactile feedback and muscle memory and to be able to do the kind of virtuosic things that I really love to see in music performance. Uh, yeah, so that's the mojo. You guys can come up and touch it or play it or whatever. Uh, afterwards, um, uh, this is uh, my newest instrument, and this is still a prototype. I wouldn't call this a prototype. I've made a, a bunch of these, and they all work pretty well. Um, this doesn't work quite as well because <laughs> uh, it's the first prototype. Uh, I build all my prototypes uh, the quickest and easiest way possible. Maybe I can move closer to cameras or up front so you guys can see what's going on. Um, so the quickest and easiest way to do stuff these days is to hack apart existing things. If I want more features on the guitar. I uh, don't build a guitar. I just go buy a cheap guitar. Uh, this is one that I've had for a long time and I put stickers all over. Um, but it's not the finest instrument, so I didn't hesitate to take uh, a bandsaw and just cut off the bottom half of it and replace it with this cool uh, custom aluminum thing. Um, and this has a lot of the similar uh, design aspects, except it's, of course, meant to uh, manipulate guitar sounds. Let's make sure. That Um, and so what's fun about this is, uh, for one thing, having uh, sensors in it, uh, like accelerometers, so you can do things traditional guitarists do in non-traditional ways. Still tuning here. Uh, yeah, so having accelerometers in it is super fun. 
there's an infrared emitter detector in it, which turns out to be really problematic in performance. You know, <laughs> the lighting, lighting person kicks in the strobe lights and suddenly your guitar is going <laughs> It's bad news. Um, so infrared, I don't use as much. Um, but it's cool having different sensors and all that kind of tactile differentiation uh, stuff I was talking about. It's cool to be able to program multiple parameters uh, to one knob. So like guitarists have long had like a volume control, you know, so you can do things like and do that kind of kind of thing. Um, but what's cool is to have that on, on the overdrive of my guitar. So I have like a clean sound that like smoothly uh, gets more distorted. So I kind of have a smooth uh, palette of, of distortion sounds from your clean, like, kind of stuff to like, mildly distorted things to your overdrive. So that's a whole bunch of parameters tied to one knob, which is something uh, that happens in software, which is really cool. I'll just show you some more drawings. Um, drawings are cool. <laughs> this is getting really geeky about like which things do what, and this is another part of the art that that I do, uh, which is um, yeah, just saying like I've got these sensors, I like these sensors, but what are these sensors going to do to a guitar? It's a, it's a pretty open and creative thing. Uh, so one thing I'm happy with is I got these, uh, these little uh, resistive touch strips, which are cool. And so I have that uh, assigned to like a filter and, and the volume. So I can just tap this thing. It's cool with distortion. And it's all on the face of the guitar too, I should point out. Like lots of guitars do this with a pedal board. You know, there's this a vast, vast catalog of like guitarists who do awesome stuff with pedals. Um, but there's something really, you know, you can only do so much with your, your feet and, and a switch or a little uh, uh, expression pedal or whatever. So uh, being able to do all the same kind of things with my hands opens up a lot of possibilities. Being able to combine all these different controls um, uh, is, is really powerful too. Um, and then coming up with things you couldn't do with the, the pedals. Um, so like one thing, um, one of my favorite guitar pedal uh, guitar players is really well known for, uh, Tom Morello. He does a lot with this thing called the whammy pedal, which is like a pitch shifter. It just takes notes and um, pitch shifts them up or down. So I just have that on a joystick, which is kind of cool because for one thing, I have <laughs> I have more facility with my hands than Tom does with his feet. And we haven't actually battled it out, but uh, but uh, I'll just stake that claim anyway, and he can he can come and challenge me anytime. <laughs> um, but potentially, yeah. So I can do like a smooth kind of gesture, like or more erratic, like. something in between like <laughs> so uh, it's really cool how all my childhood video game playing experience is wrapping back around into music <laughs> I never thought that would happen um, so equally as cool as like, oh, well, buttons are really fun. There's this, this two-hand tapping technique that a guy named Eddie Van Halen popular, popularized where you go like, I'm not Eddie Van Halen, but something like. So you're using a bunch of fingers on one string to get all these different pitches like really fast. And do all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I can do a similar thing with that pitch shifter and these like old school gaming buttons, right? So just one note. So 
it's it's really fun to play this thing. It kind of like transforms the guitar into a, a, a different uh, animal, and I'm really I have to say I've not tamed the beast yet. Um, so a lot of what you're hearing and saying is just like uh, a new stuff for me, but it's really fun to go through a new uh, phase of learning with a new instrument. Um, and that's what you see if you come check me out tomorrow night um, at 8 o'clock. Uh, just to show you some more prototyping tricks, this is, uh, this is the RoboCaster. This is the next version of the RoboCaster, which hasn't uh, been born yet, but this is like putting all the sensors into Tupperware and hooking it up. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and learning Arduino. This is something I'm really excited about because up till now, these have uh, just been built with these, uh, these really simple build your own MIDI controller kits, which are great if you don't want to uh, um, get into coding. Coding is something I don't do too much of. I use a lot of uh, these object-oriented programming languages, which are simpler for you know musician types who don't want to get too deep. And it's more like little boxes you hook up with lines and keeps this beautiful analogy in my head of uh, of ones and zeros kind of working like electricity, which I'm not so sure they do. But <laughs> uh, anyways, there's an Arduino in this, which is great. So it's the first time I'll be able to do uh, lower level stuff and have uh, things happen in the, in the firmware of the instrument that previously I had to do in software. It'll make, uh, this is gonna be an open source project. So all these, uh, these drawings and uh, the parts list, you know, where, where I get these cool sensors. Um, which ones I selected, you know, I have this giant wall of buttons in my house at home. It's like 100 different gaming buttons to, you know, decide which one was, was best for the guitar. And um, so all that will be uh, free open knowledge and then the, the Arduino stuff will be open too. So, you know, maybe you can improve the firmware of my guitar or make uh, the guitar sound cool. Um, and this, this I, I just left behind in San Francisco. This is gonna be like the, uh, the finished one, so this one's all. Uh, CNC routed out of uh, out of uh, alder and aluminum, and it's going to be pretty awesome. Um, cool. How much time do I have? I'm like an hour. Is that? Yeah. Cool. Fifteen hours? <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, okay, this, this isn't the most exciting instrument ever because it's gone through very little evolution. Um, so I'm, I'm still figuring out how, what kind of vocalist I am. I've only been uh, vocalizing uh, for like the last year. I'm taking voice lessons and <clears throat> trying to work, work some things out. Um, so this is just a bunch of buttons that are, that are just sort of extension corded into my microphone, but I thought it'd be cool to talk about this anyway. Um, it's just eight buttons on here. It makes me really loud all of a sudden. Uh, and it does simple things like echo, 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 and distortion. Um, and really fun things too, like for some of my songs, I have programmed, <coughs> I have programmed backup singers. Shut me down. So no matter what I'm singing, I have this group of auto-tuned vocalists who, no matter what I say, at what pitch, they're kind of just nailing it. And <laughs> it's really helpful, really helpful to have uh, those awesome robotic background singers. Um, uh, so that, that's about all the magic of, of this thing, but you'll hear me do a lot with this because it's just a cool, fun way to, to kind of transform your voice and being able to like punctuate things with echo, 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 echo. Or say something really profound and be like, you know what, I walked here with my feet. It just adds a new dimension to like everything you say. And I imagine one day I'll just have this everywhere I go. And I'm gonna be like, hey, how's it going? Are you doing all right? Um, so this, this too was lots of fun. New toys are always the most fun. Um, so that's all the instruments I brought here. Um, but I wanted, really wanted to talk about something I'm excited about. Because I've been doing this kind of stuff for a long time and I'm really well known uh, on the interwebs and I have all these videos uh, demonstrating this kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's cool that this kind of uh, idea of embracing 
mechanical controller type things as legitimate instruments is now kind of a, a mainstream thing, at least in music. And you know, you go to a pop concert, you'll see somebody with something with blinky lights up there. Um, and uh, the proliferation of, of DJ culture has a lot to do with that. Um, so that's all well and good, but I'm kind of done evangelizing these kind of instruments because there's no longer anything to evangelize. You know, most musicians, DJs, music makers are like, yeah, those are instruments. I want to play those. Those are fun. That's cool. Um, so that leads me to like, well, what's next? I'm always interested in the newest, interesting, uh, exciting, most fun kind of toy. Um, so I'm interested in these things I call uh, uh, jam boxes. Um, and these basically, to me, um, fill a cultural gap. Like, how many of you people um, uh, grew up in the era of jukeboxes and you'd go down and like put a nickel in and like listen to your favorite song? <laughs> One. All right, yeah, cool. Represent. Uh, the jukebox was like huge. I mean, imagine like you know when records were a new thing, and suddenly there was this like you know this machine you could just stroll up to, and it had this huge catalog of music, and for your nickel or whatever, you got to hear any song you wanted. It was like being able to control the DJ on the radio. I don't even know what it was like because it's before my time. But those are gone. Uh, who remembers these things? Anybody play these things as a kid? <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, so you know, pinball, it's like the precursor to arcade video games. Pretty rad. Uh, to me, it's like the analog video game or whatever. You know, I was, I was born at a time when, when these are on the way out. But um, pretty awesome, pretty revolutionary in their own kind of way. And this was kind of more the staple um, when I was growing up. And this was, to me, phenomenal, just going to a place full of these things, spending a whole bunch of money. Um, in one afternoon, but getting this great uh, fix. And I think all these things have kind of like uh, faded away and left this big gap, you know? Um, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not in touch with uh, the kids these days. <laughs> and I don't know what they're doing, but to me it seems like there's nothing quite filling that gap. And so, in my mind, um, you know, music uh, has changed a lot in the last 10 years, mostly by the internet and file sharing. And, you know, we look at uh, at least forward-thinking people look at music in a totally different way, you know, and I think uh, change isn't really good or bad. It's just happening and <laughs> should get used to it. Um, but what I want to do is, is make more of these things. Um, this is something I encountered uh, the second time I went to Burning Man. It's called the Improbable Orchestra, um, and this was there the first year that I brought a jam box uh, to a festival. Um, and it's basically a four-player music-making machine, and it doesn't have a screen, um, it doesn't have anything but knobs and buttons, um, but people would just play this thing for hours and they'd flip out in ways I'd never seen people flip out, uh, at least not since I was a kid playing, you know, <laughs> Super Mario Brothers or Street Fighter II for the first time. Um, and not only that, but doing it together. And there's something about making music with other people. You know, you can see I'm not really doing that in my performances. <clears throat> but there's something really special about humans making music with other humans. Um, which uh, hopefully you have experienced, or you'll get to experience. Um, so these things are out there. This is uh, the React table. This is like a big um, uh, camera slash projector in a table. Um, this came out of a university in Barcelona, and the camera recognizes the different symbols on the underside of those little plastic pog things, and those all represent different elements of a modular synthesizer. So this is like a really uh, kind of like academic sort of high-level jam box pretty hard to make, uh, make beats and stuff um, compared to the improbable orchestra. Uh, this is one from the UK called the, the Drum Machine, uh, recently built. These are some of my theoretical designs. So these are like images I've put together. You can see how this you know, relates to the mojo with the, uh, the, uh, the hand shape kind of things. Um, this is thinking about like how can we do this with mobile devices? That would be easy. <laughs> Uh, this is giant harp kind of version. <laughs> uh, this is this is one I'm, I'm talking to a company in Berlin about. Um, they make controllers and sell controllers, and they're the perfect kind of people to have one of these things to show off their controllers. Um, here's some that I actually have built. So this is the one that I built for Burning Man in 2005. It's made from uh, keyboards, uh, cheap. Keyboards. These were kind of like the only controllers you could get in 2005. Either these or something that looked kind of like these things. Um, so this one's full of like uh, samples. Another really fun thing is uh, sampled music, taking your favorite pop song or 
movie quote or whatever and just being able to chop that up and sync that up to music is super, super fun. Um, so that's what the Octomasher is about. It's also kind of like intense when you have eight people uh, jamming at the same time. Fifteen. It's the Octomasher, dude. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is the Mini Masher. This was totally scaling back, whereas this is 400 pounds of stuff uh, and it's awesome. You can set it up at events like this and it'll take a beating and runs for days with no problems. Uh, it's a lot of equipment to haul around and it's really tough to get from A to B and set up all these different little modules. So I said, I'm gonna put it all in one big box. Um, so this is a, a nice uh, uh, acrylic uh, version of that with just three sides and a bunch of blinky lights. And again, uh, made out of hacks, existing controllers. And uh, this one I thought would be fun to make a transparent one so you could see all the guts inside and curious people could just like look at it and see what's going on. Um, and this one's full of music from uh, current electronic musicians. I have all these uh, fellow electronic musicians who send me uh, their songs as multi-track uh, recordings and they're like, hey, won't you remix my song? And I did them one better and just put it in the machine and now I let people um, at events remix their songs for them. Uh, and then I, I made like the pro version. You know, I have uh, other performers like me who have uh, some facility on a traditional instrument, like a keyboard or a microphone, um, who also play controllers. And so this is the machine I uh, built to kind of uh, facilitate that kind of performance. And this is full of my original music. Um, and I played a few shows with this. Um, yeah, so that's about it. I just have some slides here to remind you. Uh, that I'm playing tomorrow. <coughs> I might look something like that. Uh, there's a workshop tomorrow and Saturday afternoon, uh, 1600, 4 p.m. in the hardware hacking area. We'll, we'll build these thingies. Um, and that's it, so I can open it up for some questions. Does anybody have questions? Anyone? Okay. Okay, hey, um, so I have just one question. Um, you know about, um, you, you, do you know Beardy Man, um, no. Darren Foreman? I don't know him, but I'm a fan. Yeah, and he got this rig with um, iPads and, and sampling and this, and it's also a hacked music machine. Cool. So. Yeah, I heard he was building his own custom yep. Beardy Man looper. I've seen him, um, I think, two months ago, and uh, the rig is finished, and it's really great. So you have to have a look at it. Yeah, cool. Thanks for the tip. Question way in the back. There is a question from the internet. Thank you. Uh, the internet unfortunately didn't get to see all of the Robocaster. So if you could just hold it into the camera over there and show like the resistive touch scripts, oh. for example, and maybe say a few words. Hey, internet. <laughs> I know both of you are out there. Uh, what's up with your crappy connection? Um, <laughs> I think I'm supposed to show you what I showed you, what I showed these people, uh, which is uh, touch strips to control filters and volume at the same time. Uh, and buttons and joysticks to play with pitch shifters. <laughs> question there. Hey, Hi. first of all, thanks for your talk. It was very inspiring to me. Um, you did a great deal of using uh, game controllers for doing music. Have you ever thought of doing it the other way around, using native instruments like basses and guitars as input for um, video games? Well, I know the, the, the rock band Guitar Hero, uh, the l recent iteration of that got into, you know, um, 
a guitar controller that was all covered with switches and a real keyboard. And yeah. I think they've kind of explored that area. The gaming industry is kind of daunting to me. I have a brother who works in it, and, and he's, you know, uh, it's just such a massive thing. It reminds me of the way people talked about the recording, music recording industry in like the 80s and the 90s. And I'd love to get involved in some, you know, indie game development. Um, but it seems like, you know, big companies like Activision are kind of, you know, owning this space right now, and, and that's why I've drifted so far away from from games. Um, but yeah, you're right. Um, that's that, that's an underexplored area using traditional instruments to play games. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I guess you were first. Oh, okay. you, you were first. Thanks. Um, can you talk about the process of uh, starting with something like a guitar or a mic that has an output signal and transforming it with buttons? Like what do you, what, how do you actually manipulate it? Uh, that's a cool question, yeah. I, I still have the software running, so um, I can show you the software tools I work with. Let's see if this works. Uh, let's try uh, do mirroring. So this is, uh, I use Ableton Live as a host, which is a really popular piece of music software, um, and so I have um, a lot going on here. Uh, <laughs> and it would take too long to explain all of this, um, but a simple thing I can do, um, oh, I hope I can do, I have some screen resolution issues, uh, is, is show you one of the signal processing channel strips. Um, yeah, so here, this is cool. Um, uh, so here's my guitar. Uh, oh wow, that looks interesting. <laughs> uh, the signal for my guitar flows through here, and you can see little uh, audio meters in between in between devices. Um, and it's really to do it at the basic levels. It's as simple as um, you just. Oh, well, there's an example. Um, there's a button there that says punch. Um, so this just simply gates the volume on and off, so I can swell the volume smoothly, or I can just hit the punch. Uh, and that's as simple as, as dragging one of these modules into the software, and you say learn, and you press your button, and then it's assigned. And it's actually really simple. This is a great piece of music software if any of you are interested in just playing around with something. something. This is uh, become phenomenally popular. It's like 10 years old, but I've been working with it since the beginning. And it, it's the inspiration for a lot of this live performance um, because it smooths out that, that uh, learning curve for, for making stuff like this happen. Um, so it's pretty much Ableton and all these cool uh, expansions uh, that work with Ableton. Uh, like you can now run uh, this object-oriented programming language called Max uh, inside of Ableton. So this is like a custom Max patch that I made that um, takes uh, the buttons that control the pitch shifter and translates them to pitches. So that's 7, 12, and 19. Those represent uh, uh, pitch shifting values uh, with musical significance. So and there's also like a priority thing, you know, the higher pitches take priority over the lower buttons. And so anyways, Ableton is, is, I think, the answer to that question. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead. Um, a question about the, the connection between the controllers and the software. I, I assume everything is MIDI, right? Yeah, these are just class compliant MIDI controllers. Um, and there's just a USB cable. It's a nice USB cable. Okay. Uh, that's it. And, and do you, are you aware of any open source software? Or, or, uh, or different types of connections, like like um, more low level uh, stuff. Uh, well, MIDI's pretty low level. It's <laughs> <laughs> it's from 1984 or something like that, and it's remarkable that it's still working, uh, or you know, still so ubiquitous in musical instruments. There's other protocols like HID, human interface device, which you people might be more familiar with. That's more for gaming and ma mouse and keyboard. I think is the origin of that. Uh, and that works too. It's just not implemented in music software uh, as frequently. Um, and then there's uh, newer things that try to, you know, be better than MIDI, like OSC, Open Sound Control, is another one. Um, uh, but it lacks in a lot of the ways that uh, that MIDI makes things really easy. Um, so MIDI is, is still really kind of elegant, and that's why 
um, it's still used. Uh, so you, it's like the standard, basically, because it still works. And uh, there's a good white paper on MIDI. It's, a, it's an open standard. It's not something proprietary. And uh, um, there's a good paper explaining why, uh, by the people who you know, continue the standard uh, as to like, why it's still relevant and it's not really lacking any features. Uh, the, 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 what, what I meant to ask, uh, uh, although you answered par part of my question, um, so one more question is, are you aware of stuff that don't require a computer, a PC, with, with actual software? Yeah, uh, I love working with a PC because it's such a powerful tool. Um, but, you know, Arduino leads to other things like Raspberry Pi and, you know, these other computing platforms. Um, uh, but, yeah, the PC is still just this flexible thing and I also need to like, you know, type lots of email <laughs> on airplanes. <laughs> and so that dual function uh, helps out a lot. Um, but yeah, I, that's, that's cool territory I would love to explore. Um, I think we're running out of time, so if there's short, short questions. Uh, I'm short I hope so. How much time and money would someone have to invest to build all of your stuff? Uh, it depends. Do you want to put it in Tupperware or do you want to put it in custom aluminum? <laughs> The cheapest. The cheapest. Um, not that much. I have friends who teach build your own MIDI controller workshops, and you know, under hundred dollars will get you all the parts to do something pretty basic. And if you reclaim parts from existing, you know, potentiometers and buttons, like they haven't changed, so you can rip them out of old things. You can uh, buy them at surplus stores and, and do a lot of this stuff really cheap. You know, it's usually the triangle of like time, money, quality. <laughs> you gotta be in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, I guess my question goes somewhere in the same area. So um, I wonder, you said you use a standard like a MIDI kit. Um, can you give some resources where someone could find something like that? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm most stoked about using Arduino because now you can reprogram the Ar Arduino's USB controller to be a, a MIDI class compliant MIDI device. Um, but this has something from Livid Instruments which is a kit. Uh, this has something from a company called uh, Hail Micro, which is a kit. Um, but the Livid Instruments one is really easy to work with, and that's what I've built most of my instruments with in the last couple of years. So you would say it's best to start with Arduino? <laughs> yeah, Arduino will be cheaper and more customizable. So if you have experience with it or you're interested in it, I would recommend that. But if you want something fast and simple, uh, the Livid Instruments uh, brain is very useful. Okay, we, we still won't be thrown out of this room for another about 15 minutes, so you still have some chance to ask a question, and maybe it could be, will you play another tune for us? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we, have, <laughs> we have one serious question left. Cool. There is one serious question left. Hi, sorry, I don't want to interrupt the uh, performance, but um, you touched on this briefly. Um, I uh, played with the Manchester P Orchestra, which is a pure data group. Um, and one of the problems that we've had is, is we're all sat behind our screens, like tapping away on our game pads and stuff. Mm -hmm. People in the audience just sort of stare over at a bunch of people in the corner and think, are they actually playing this? Or is that, you know, like the sound text in the corner or something? And it's quite difficult to sort of perform when you're typing on a keyboard or, you know, we've not got the level of integration you've got with an instrument there, but I wonder if you might like to say a bit about, expand a bit, as, as you mentioned earlier, about the sort of the virtuoso side or how you go from, you know, it being a computer to it being an instrument and yet everyone understands the guitar. Yeah, um, that was one of the biggest inspirations for doing all this work was a show I went to in like 2003, I think. Uh, and it was the first time I encountered this, what, what we call the checking email on stage performance <laughs> aesthetic, <laughs> you know, whereas this well-known techno producer from Germany and his performance consisted of this. And the music was excellent and I'm sure he was doing lots of interesting things. But nobody there really knew what they were. And um, uh, that's cool, you know, that's one aesthetic and a lot of peop artists have chosen to go in that direction of, you know, let's have a giant 3D projection mapped sculpture behind me and then nobody will notice that I'm checking my email. <laughs> uh, but I was inspired by that show to go in the other direction and figure out like the, what's this giant gap of understanding between uh, 
between audiences and performers. And so that led to things like de-emphasizing the laptop and figuring out how I could perform without yeah, ever looking at the laptop screen. Um, if you come to see me uh, play tomorrow night, you know, in the, in the idea of like showing audiences what's going on, for a long time I've been performing with the mojo on a stand. So it just sits here, like tilted towards the audience. It's also better for my wrists that way, actually. But um, then you can kind of see what's going on. Um, and the same thing uh, was, was a thought in the design of, of, of the microphone mojito was like, I'll put the buttons on the back side. Like, that's kind of where my fingers, fingers go. This one needs some work. But um, uh, you can see when I'm pushing buttons it's, it's, or when I'm not. And, and that uh, it winds up usually making the instruments more fun and intuitive to play. And then it uh, kind of reveals some of what's happening to audiences. And to me, that's, that's part of what I love about music performance is seeing and understanding. And basically, being, there being this, this connection that's crossable for an audience member who was me 10 years ago or whatever, you know, who didn't know about any of this stuff, to you know, understanding, like getting the inspiration. Like, that's what I feel like my job is really, is to inspire people. Um, maybe not to do what I've done, but just you know, do something creative and uh, interesting and fulfilling, I hope. And, uh, um, so that's why I love to like show off what I do, and even the mistakes, you know, are 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 there for you to see. <clears throat> yeah, maybe one more question, and then I don't I'm so unprepared. For yeah, um, in your uh, job, you're basically relying on very custom instruments. So, have you ever thought about this possibility? What happens if something uh, happens to them just before the show? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's why I want to be at more hacker conferences, because it's like, oh no, where am I going to find a soldering iron? Like, uh, there's a hundred right there. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great point. And actually, I'm, that's why I'm moving in the direction of trying to work with you know, a guitar builder to make this thing and to make copies of it so it's not like a one-of-a-kind thing. Um, and that was part of the, the design of this revision of the Mojo. I actually made and sold 10 copies of it because there were enough people who were like, where can I get that? I really want that. I have the money. I will pay you for that. Um, and so, you know, eventually this gap between these crazy custom one-of-a-kind things that I do worry about them getting stolen or broken or whatever and this mass-marketed stuff that you know, is cool and has lots of amazing qualities, but doesn't really meet the demands of um, my demands for live music performance. Like I see that getting getting a lot closer. You know, and if there's there's a, something in the future that is 90% of what the Mojo is, but I could buy you know in any music store in any city, like I would totally use that for exactly that reason. So it's a good argument for using non-custom instruments. Um, You've been standing here a long time. Do you have a question? Or you are? <laughs> this, do you have a question? Oh. These are the angels. Oh, you're angels. Oh, you're the audio angel. I'm sorry, I forgot. So I guess. Don't, don't. Tunes. <laughs> uh, okay, something is wrong. I'm fixing <laughs> troubleshooting on stage. This is this is guitar effects. This is kind of cool, right? Here's the problem. Just turn it off. Uh, this might be a disaster because when you run, uh, well, good little tip for anybody interested: don't run <laughs> slideshow software and music software at the same time. <laughs> Made the mistake too many times. Uh, all right. Um, sure. Yeah. What do we play? Um, oh, I don't want to play. <laughs> This will be quick and easy and fun. And if you if you can name this tune afterwards, I'll give you a special prize. <laughs> so this is not my. Yes, toxic. <laughs> <laughs> Free bird.
got. Uh... Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I can't put my email back up there, but it's moldover at moldover.com. Um, come talk to me. I love to make new friends. I don't know that many people uh, here. So um, yeah, thanks for being here. I hope to see you again.